Welcome to Environmental Sustainability. So uh, part of this course is learning about the environment, learning about the influence that humans have on the environment. So in order to get into that, we start off by talking about genetics, evolution, and really, you know, how did we get here? How did we as humans uh, get to the point that we are right now? Right? We, there weren't always humans that were around. Uh, there were other organisms and they slowly progressed into uh, humans. So we talk about our genetics and how we uh, progress to become humans over time. It's important to understand that with genetics, um, you know, we're talking about DNA. We're talking about the instructions that are there uh, for us to, that really makes up who we are. So all organisms have a set of instructions. They have a genome. They have genetics. Um, and that's going to determine their characteristics. The instructions are called genes and they're passed on to offspring from the parent organisms. Uh, the instructions are organized into a code and that's what we call the DNA. The DNA molecule makes up all organisms' genes. We see that DNA consists of segments um, and those segments are genes. Genes make up DNA. DNA is made up of genes. So um, we'll look at that in, the, in a moment. The DNA is organized into structures called chromosomes. So DNA is this very long strand that uh, you know, if you if you were to to stretch it all the way out, it would it would stretch for numerous feet, and it, it wouldn't look like something that would fit into a little cell into a nucleus. So it's actually wound up into these structures called chromosomes that then go into the nucleus of a cell. DNA is made up of deoxyribose sugar molecules, phosphate molecules, and nitrogenous bases. So we see that um, when we're looking at it, our DNA, all right, this is our DNA. It is a uh, twisted ladder that we call a double helix. And uh, this twisted ladder, if we were to just take a segment of it and we say that this segment right here codes for something, all right, we would say that that is a gene. Okay, it might be longer. This says, shows that, hey, maybe from here to here is a gene. We could say maybe from here to here, if it was all wound up, would be a gene. So little segments make up uh, the the genes of the DNA. And the human genome has about 30,000 uh, uh, genes to it. So when we look at a cell, cell is going to have organelles. You've learned this in the past, but one of the organelles, the big one that everyone always remembers, is the nucleus. And within that nucleus, you have these chromosomes. And the chromosomes are the organized DNA. So as much as we like to separate the, these things into different names, we talk about the chromosomes, we talk about the genes, we talk about the DNA, it's all talking about the same thing, all right? They're all, it's all the same thing that's making up what we are. It is defining our characteristics. Um, the nitrogenous bases are the components that make up the DNA code, so um, when we talk about it having a deoxyribose sugar and having a phosphate group and having a, uh, a um, uh, nitrogenous base, okay, really these are the chemical components that make it DNA, but what's going to make it different in different segments, what's going to create that code per se, is going to be these nitrogenous bases, which are adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. So. You know, typically when we're in high school, we just abbreviate them into A, T, G, and C. And that same goes for this course. You just need to understand that you have these four different nitrogenous bases that are going to make up the code. When we look at a DNA molecule or, or a, a diagram of DNA molecule, typically it's just this twisted ladder. But within here, we're going to see that this is our deoxyribose backbone. And it's going to have a phosphate group attached to it. And then we're going to have the nitrogenous bases. And nitrogenous bases, we're going to have uh, adenine, which is going to pair up with thymine. And we have guanine, which is going to pair up with cytosine. So when DNA replicates, all right, any time that we're trying to make new cells, so if you cut yourself, yourself you scrape your knee, um, you're growing as a, uh, at any point in your life, um, you're going to have to make more cells and in order to make more cells we need to make more nuclei or another nucleus which means we need more DNA we any DNA any cell is going to have DNA and we need the new cell to also have DNA so what's going to happen is the DNA 
um, we have a, this this ladder. All right, we're going to unzip it down the middle, and then we're going to add new nitrogenous bases to each side of that ladder. So if we have our DNA, it's a double helix, but we can look at it like a ladder. If we were to untwist it just for our purposes, so that we can it makes sense to us, it looks just like a ladder. And what we see is that all right, we have our nitrogenous bases on one side and we have our nitrogenous bases on the other side and what we do is we can unzip it and then this one can go over here and we can start building off of that and then this one will go over here and we start building off of that so now what we do is we have this half ladder and if we know that A is always going to go with T and and T is always going to go with A and C is always going to go with G and G is always going to go with C um, we can say that, hey, if I have this ladder, that this half ladder is A, T, C, and G, well, I know what to add or, or how to build my other side of my ladder. Because remember, this went over here to do its own thing, and then this came down here. So A is going to go with T, and T is going to go with A, and C is going to go with G, and G is going to go with C. So that is how we make our new DNA. And the same thing goes for this one over here we took this one and it went over here and we started to add to that ladder so whenever we're replicating DNA we're able to unzip it and we're able to build DNA with just half of of the DNA with just one strand it has these double strands that we're going to be able to break up into single strands and then build off of each single strand just by knowing the rule of complementary base pairing that's what we call it that's that whole rule that a goes with T and T goes with A and C goes with G and G goes with C. So, for example, if I have one strand and, you know, I just, I drew it going up and down, but um, if we look at it horizontally and I have a strand that is A, T, C, G, T, G, C, A, well, then I know that the other side of that strand, okay, or the, when I'm going to uh, pair up the new bases with it, I know that A is going to go with T and T is going to go with A and C is going to go with G and G is going to go with C and T is going to go with A and G goes with C and C goes with G and A goes with T. So when I have one strand, it could be any mix of these four, any combination of these four nitrogenous bases, but just by knowing the one strand, I can know how to build my entire DNA, how to replicate my DNA. When we talk about... Um, DNA as uh, characteristics, how does it influence what characteristics that we have? Well, we looked at how we can replicate our DNA, all right, but what, how is it that suddenly we have this, this molecule that has all these different nitrogenous bases and this little code to it? How does that eventually create um, our characteristics, all right? What does that have to do with our characteristics? Well, Ultimately, DNA is going to dictate what proteins are built. We're made up of carbohydrates, uh, proteins, and and uh, and lipids or fats. But proteins are really what's going to make us. Okay, every you know everything uh, you know our muscles, all the important things in our body. We need to make proteins. So protein synthesis is how that that we're going to see that correlation between what's in our DNA and how we're different from someone that that has different DNA. So the proteins that make us up are created by those instructions of our DNA because the DNA is going to dictate what amino acids are made and amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. All right, so our DNA is going to create those amino acids, and the amino acids are going to come together and form these, these large protein molecules. So the DNA creates instructions for the cells to make these proteins, and the instructions are actually, they look like ha uh, single strands of DNA. They're called mRNA. Um, in mRNA, there are no Ts. There are only Us because there's no thymine. There's uracil. So instead of thymine, we now have uracil. So the mRNA is sent to another organelle. So it leaves the nucleus. And I always tell students that it's kind of like the DNA is like the the if you only had one copy of the most important book that that you you own. All right. Say you know you, your most important book is 
is the Bible. There's the, it's the last Bible on the earth. Well, you're not going to let your friend borrow that last Bible, all right? But maybe you'll let them make copies of it. So what you're going to do, what same thing with DNA, you're not going to send out your DNA out of the nucleus to the ribosomes to use it and make these amino acids. But you're going to you're going to make maybe a copy of that DNA and then send that copy to the ribosomes so that they can read the instructions. And this this is exactly what happens. So the DNA is in the nucleus is going to make the this copy, which is mRNA, and it's going to send the copy of its instructions out to the ribosomes to build those proteins out of those amino acids. So just as an example, when we have when we're using protein synthesis, all right, we have our DNA code. And say that, just for example, this is our DNA code. We have a section of DNA. We have a gene that, that uh, goes A, G, T, A, C, G, G, T, A. Well, just by knowing complementary base pairing in, in terms of, of uh, protein synthesis, we know that A, well, we no longer have T's in mRNA or in our instructions. We have U's now. So A is going to go with U. G still goes with C. T still goes with A. A is going to go with U now, C goes with G still, G, C, G, C, T goes with A, and A now goes with U. Now we have our instructions. These are This is our copy of our instructions that we're going to send out of the nucleus to our ribosomes, and then the ribosomes use these instructions to know what protein to make, what amino acids to use to build these long proteins. And what we do is we look at... Um, an amino acid chart because we know which directions or which instructions are going to say which amino acids are, are to be made. So we look at something like this, all right, and say you have UUU, well, that's going to make phenylalanine. In our, and when with us, we're looking for first UCU, so it's always going to be these segments of three, UC, or UCA, excuse me. So we look for this and we have UCA, so that's going to make serine. Then our next segment, UGC, all right, UGC, UGC, all right, it's going to make cysteine. And then last one, CAU, all right, we have to look through our amino acid chart. And CAU is going to make histidine. So just by knowing those instructions, we know what amino acid is going to be called up to help form that protein. So now this could be a portion of a protein. Now, in reality, proteins are mu much longer. They make up, uh, they're, they're made of a lot more amino acids. Typically, hundreds or even thousands of amino acids are going to make up a protein. But just in practice, just in trying to understand this, we just look at a small segment to say, hey, we have this DNA code. We are going to make this copy for the instructions to send to the ribosomes from the nucleus. And then this is what comes out. So um, people always talk about mutations. Well, mutation is just a change in the DNA. And we see that if something is copied wrong, if the DNA changes somewhere along the way, if during DNA replication there's there's a problem or during uh, protein synthesis something is off, well, we'll see then there's going to be a mutation. and um, it could be something that doesn't really matter, or it could be something that is a major issue, such as sickle cell anemia. So when we look at sickle cell anemia, they have uh, a mutation in their DNA that's creating the wrong proteins. It's telling those cells to make the wrong uh, or to, to put together the wrong amino acids and make the wrong protein. And that's what makes your uh, cells, your red blood cells, instead of them being round and kind of donut shaped, they're going to be this sickle shape, which causes major issues in individuals. So mutations are issues. It's a change in the DNA that then we are going to see uh, in, in our, our characteristics. And um, when we talk about DNA, we knew about DNA for, for many dec decades, but now we're starting to get into the, the Point where we're trying to pinpoint the different genes and how they influence our characteristics. So during the 1990s, there was this major push to determine the entire sequence of human DNA because uh, we thought that, hey, if we knew 
the entire sequence of the DNA of human DNA, then we would know what each characteristic was and how it made us and how there was an, you know maybe health issues in different people or whatever it may be. So they, we wanted to figure out the entire sequence. Now, keep in mind about 99 percent. All right, over 99% of your DNA is the same as anybody else. So it's only about 1% of your DNA that we see, less than 1% of your DNA is the difference between you and the next person. So they thought if we could figure out the other 99%, then it would be help us with healthcare and understanding how uh, to help people in the future. Um, this was called the Human Genome Project. They wrapped it up. They said that it was completed around 2003. Um, and, you know, the hope was to learn all the genes and, and the entire genome, the entire sequence of the DNA in order to pinpoint characteristics and maybe health problems and, and maybe help with healthcare in the future. Um, but researchers ultimately learned that the code was only part of the equation. It was only part of the equation. There was more to it. The genes could be turned on and turned off. So now it's not just a matter of do you have this gene or do you not have this gene. Now it's is the gene turned on or is the gene turned off. So this made, makes uh, you know understanding the characteristics we see even more complicated. And the study of this gene expression is called epigenetics. So previously, when we were just looking at the genome, we were looking at just genetics. Okay, that, you know, made it seem a lot easier, um, less complex. But now we're starting to see, you know, once we started wrapping up the Human Genome Project and we started to see that, hey, wait a second, we're figuring all this stuff out, but now we're seeing that different people might have the same gene, but one person expresses the gene or, or shows the gene, and the other one doesn't show that characteristic. And it's all because of epigenetics. It's because of the fact that some genes can be expressed and some genes aren't expressed. So it's not as simple as just knowing that, oh, this person has the gene or they don't have the gene. Now there's another level to it. So researchers... Now they study the changes in the epigenome. They, they study the changes in if genes are turned on and turned off. And it's the winding of the DNA around these histones. So while the genetic code is important, the epigenome can change the traits, even though the code remains the same. So, you know, you can have one trait. Someone else doesn't have that trait. But, um, or someone else also has, has that trait. Uh, that gene, you have that gene, but one person has the trait, the other one does not have the trait. So DNA is wrapped around these proteins called histones, and there's two factors, two major factors in how tightly the DNA is wrapped around the histones, and the factors are methyl tags and acetyl tags. So the more methyl tags uh, that we see, that's going to silence the gene, and the more acetyl tags that we see will make the gene active. So here we see that. Um, if there is a methyl tag, okay, it's going to wrap it and it's going to wrap it even tighter around these histones. All right, these are our histones that our DNA is wrapping around. And the tighter that they are, all right, they're not available for us to use for protein synthesis to make those proteins. So methyl groups, uh, methyl tags, we see that that's going to silence the gene and acetyl tags. All right, that is going to make the gene available for creating these proteins. So although methylation, which is adding those methyl tags, always silences genes, makes the gene not available to be used, some genes are good and some are bad. So we cannot say it is always a positive or always a negative thing. So you can't, you know, a lot of times people might think of methylation as maybe a bad thing. It's silencing genes. We don't want it to silence our genes. But there are good genes and there are bad genes. So methylation isn't necessarily a good thing or a bad thing. It's really all relative to what are we talking about. So methyl tags, um, they, we do know that they connect to cytosine, uh, typically in locations where the sequence contains a cytosine and a guanine next to each other. Acetylation, less methyl tags will mean more acetyl tags. All right, that will connect to the tail of the histone and unwind the DNA to make genes more active. So while methyl tags are winding up that DNA and not making that DNA accessible, acetyl tags are unwinding that DNA and making uh, that DNA more accessible, those genes more accessible or more active. 
So just remember this relationship where uh, it, you can't have a lot of methyl tags and a lot of acetyl tags or a little bit of acetyl tags, a little bit of methyl tags. They're directly related. So if there's more methyl tags, there's less acetyl tags. And if there's less methyl tags, then there's more acetyl tags. And this just shows you how less less methyl tags we're going to see the gene is on right it's un unwound and then we see uh more methyl tags that gene is going to be turned off these are wrapped tightly the dna is wrapped tightly around these histones all right so just this is dna these are our histones dna histones we see that as they're wrapped tightly they're not available to be used we can't even get our uh, get in there to uh, make our mRNA in order to send those instructions to the ribosome. So what influences the epigenome? Well, inheritance, right, from your parents, that's going to be one thing. But the big thing that, that we study is the environment, the influence that the environment has on the epigenome, okay? We're seeing that, um, you know, it's not just all a part of what you get from your parents. Whenever we talk about genetics, we're talking about what did you get from your mom, what did you get from your dad? But we're seeing now that, well, the environment also influences your genes. It doesn't necessarily change the code, but it will change if these genes are going to be silenced or if they're going to be made available. Um, some classic examples in epigenetics. Now, epigenetics is something, it's, it's a newer field, so we don't know too much about it. We don't really know um, everything about it. We don't know all of the mechanisms and the processes involved and, and how it really works, but we do know that it exists and we do know that, um, you know, that there are certain things that influence our epigenome. So one thing is identical twins. Okay. This helps prove that, you know, epigenetics is a real thing and the environment, the influence of the environment is going to uh, have an effect on our epigenome. So identical twins, they're going to have the same exact DNA, but we're going to see that identical twins, they end up being different, right? They have different characteristics. They're going to act differently. They could end up looking a little bit differently. So the environment influences genes to be turned on and turned off. If you think about um, just something like smoking, if, if one, per, one identical twin takes care of themselves their whole life and the other one is smoking and drinking and having... We're, we can see that, okay, one's going to have wrinkled skin, one will, will not have wrinkled skin. So you know, those type of things are going to influence the epigenome. Um, another classic example, we see that in nurturing rat mothers, it's in, influenced the temper, temperament of their pups, so of their babies. Rat mothers that licked their pups more in the first week of life had pups with less stress. So if, they, if those pups have mothers that are, are uh, coddling them, we're going to see that they're going to be less prone to stress. The licking or that environmental stimuli, that, that environmental influence, it turned this one gene on. So we were able to pinpoint this one gene that that is uh, that's going to be um, acetylated. And so we're going to see acetylation in this GR gene, and that's going to turn that gene on and prove that it's not just it's not nature versus nurture, but it's actually nature and nurture. So we always hear this big debate about nature versus nurture, which one trumps the other, but it's really not one or the other, it's both. So, um, you know, we, we always talk about, uh, um, you know, the influence that people have or were they born with it, but it's really a matter of both. So don't ever let anyone tell you that they think it's nature or they think it's nurture. It's really the combination of the two. Another example is pregnant women are told to take folic acid and they've been told to take folic acid for a long time as prenatal vitamins. So when you're pregnant, they're going to say, hey, make sure you take folic acid for that baby. But really, the reason they tell you to do that is because it contains methyl donating nutrients. And, you know, honestly, they might have been saying this long before epigenetics or they knew anything about epigenetics. They just knew that uh, babies did did better when they had folic acid uh, available to them. So, But now we're starting to see it's because it contains these methyl donating nutrients to help turn off the bad genes. So we're hoping that we turn off the bad genes by having this methyl available. Methylation is going to occur to those bad genes, or we hope. Um, another example is pregnant mice were given a diet high in methyl, and they saw that their offspring had brown coats and low disease risk because an agouti gene, so they named this one gene the agouti gene, and that 
Agouti gene is turned off. So that's another bad gene that we're able to turn off. And the pregnant mice that had a methyl poor diet, they didn't have that methyl there in order to uh, silence these genes. Those mice ended up having a completely different coat, all right? They had the brown coat versus yellow coat, and they had a much higher disease risk. So it's all because of one gene. So just by turning on or turning off one single gene, remember I said there's 30,000 genes in the human genome. So just by turning on or off one gene, we see that these mice, all right, they had a different coat color, and they were prone to diseases at a different rate. This shows you the, the two mice, all right, the agouti mouse and the non-agouti mouse. Also, researchers conducted a study in Sweden, and they found that if an individual's grandfather, so this was a, a study that they did over a long period of time. They actually looked back in the records, and they, they looked at the grandfathers, and if these individual's grandfathers lived during a food shortage, shortage the individual lived longer, all right? So they're looking at your grandfather to see did your grandfather live in a time when there was a lot of food or not a lot of food and what they actually saw was that if your grandfather lived in time where there wasn't a lot of food you lived longer so i mean that doesn't sound like like that would be the case but that's what they discovered that if your grandfather uh had an abundance of food you actually lived a shorter life so there was a direct correlation so if an individual's grandfather experienced plentiful food the individual experience a shorter lifespan. And also in bees, if a larva is fed royal jelly, then this would silence a DNMT3 gene. They named it this DNMT3. All right, don't get caught up on the names. They name these genes whatever they want, and we start calling them that. But uh, so they, they silence, they see that it, if this DNMT3 gene is silenced, the bees would become a queen for the hive. So in order to become a queen for the hive, we need to silence this uh, this uh, this gene right here. Um, and the, the way that it does that is this environmental influence. All right, if they're fed that royal jelly, then they became the queen. The rest of the bees that did not receive the royal jelly would just become the regular workers. They would not become the queen to the hive. All right, so here you have the queen. All right, you see the queen is very different from the workers. Um, and that's all just one gene influenced by one factor in the environment. So you start to look at it, you start to see, hey, our environment, all right, little things in our environment throughout our lives can have major impacts that, you know, we haven't even discovered yet. We don't even know yet, but that's why, um, you know, we, we want to learn more about this and we want to understand the influences. And, and ultimately, you know, there's some things we know. We know that, hey, you know, you should eat right and you should exercise and, and everything like that. But there are more things that, plenty of more things for us to discover, to understand as we move forward. So as we move towards talking about evolution, uh, you know, you just want to understand that there are more things to genetics than what I just talked about. Obviously, we talked about DNA replication and protein synthesis, but then there's Mendelian genetics where you have the punted squares. You might have done this in school, all right, and you have, you know, a, a dominant recessive and you have a homozygous dominant and then you know you fill out and then there's non-mendelian genetics where it's it's more intricate within this where we see all right maybe uh there can be a mixing of genes where um you know it's not just going to be a purple flower or a white flower but if we mix them it could have a, a pink flower um and then we see also epigenetics that we talked about so there's several influences that are going to impact uh your characteristics and and what we see your you know, your, from your genetics. Um, evolution, it's always important to understand evolution because as we move forward and we talk about the different uh, individuals or the different species, the different animals, different organisms that are in the environment, that's part of environmental science, we want to understand how did we get here? And the way that we got here is through evolution. It's a change in a species over a long period of time. So this is over millions of years. Evolution doesn't just happen overnight. You know, it, it wasn't like uh, there was a chimpanzee, and then somewhere along the way, a, a, a mother chimpanzee and a father chimpanzee 
uh, made it and they created a homo sapien, they created a human. It just doesn't work like that. It's over millions of years that we see changes. Even over tens of thousands of years, we only see small changes. So those major changes where you see how did uh, you know, a lizard eventually get us to humans, all right? That's over millions of, of years. So when we say a species has evolved, we mean that its entire population has changed in some way, not just an individual. So if you uh, were to cut your arm off, okay, that's not evolution because you changed, right? It would have to be something that, all right, now everyone has this trait. So it's all driven by this term or, or this process called natural selection. It refers to the way that nature influences the survival and the extinction of different species. The environment is the key factor. Okay, the environment is selective, selecting, naturally selecting, natural selection, which organisms are going to live and which organisms are going to die. And over a long period of time, if an organism has a trait that is not fit for that environment, they're going to go extinct. And if another organism has a trait that is perfect for that environment, it helps them survive and live longer and ultimately live long, long enough to pass those traits on, pass those genes on, make more uh, offspring. Well, that's going to make them uh, live longer. We're going to see more individuals, more um, of that species with that trait. Um we talk about phylogenetic trees, also sometimes called evolutionary trees or cladograms. They're constructed to show the evolutionary relationships between different species. So just if we're talking about uh, one type of bird, we have this common ancestor of finches. And ultimately, over a long period of time, once these finches went to different environments, they changed because they needed to adapt. They needed to fit in with that environment. The ones that weren't able to fit in with that environment, the ones that didn't have good traits, they died off. And the ones that had better traits, they lived long enough to reproduce and pass on those good traits. So we see over time, it ended up, we, we had these warbler finches, and we had bud eater finches, and we had tree finches, and we had ground finches, and they were survivors of this common ancestor. But over time, they became different. Okay, they weren't exactly the same as the common ancestors because the nature nature started to select for different traits. So as it's selecting for different traits, we're starting to see them change over time. And, and then as these ground finches started to find other places to live, other habitats, we see that they became the seed eaters versus the cactus flower eaters versus other seed eaters. And then over time, they slowly became very different. So um, you know, in the beginning, maybe these three looked very similar to the common ancestor down here. But then if you go over millions of years and then you make your way up here, you go, wait a second. This guy doesn't look anything like this guy down here. But in reality, it, this is the same. It has a common ancestor. This this guy, this guy came from this guy but it's over millions of years and changes in the environment changes in the habitat that's going to influence how you look and what traits you have and how well you do in your habitat so when the habitat changes or when that that environment changes you're going to see a change in the traits because survival of the fittest you have to be fit for the environment when we say survival of the fittest it doesn't mean uh, the strongest the tallest the longest uh, anything like that it's just being fit for that environment. Some Sometimes you could be fit for an environment if you're small. Sometimes you could be fit if you're large. Sometimes you could be fit for an environment if you have a big beak. Sometimes if you have a small beak. Sometimes if you camouflage. Sometimes you don't need to camouflage. So it's really survival of not the biggest, the tallest, the strongest, anything like that. It's whatever. It really depends on the environment. Survival of the fittest. Um, once again, mutations are going to be changes in the DNA errors that bring rise to new traits for natural selection to act on. So we talk about mutations. Typically, we think of them as a bad thing. We don't want mutations. We don't want a change in the DNA that, that might cause problems for us. But when we look back in uh, history, evolutionary history, all right, these mutations, that might be what caused something to survive while others didn't have that trait and weren't able to survive. And the ones with the mutations were able to pass on their genes to the next uh, to their offspring and the ones that didn't have the mutations, they weren't fit for that environment. They, they didn't have a, a leg up on the next guy and they died off and they weren't able to live long enough to pass on those traits. When we look at our 
personal evolutionary history. Okay, we, we talk about different species that kind of paved the way to becoming human. So everything started as these single-celled organisms. The single-celled organisms became multicellular organisms. But somewhere along the way, we see that there were certain species that we call transitional species. And they're the species that really paved the way they had major differences that helped lead the way to what we are now. So certain species have a major impact on future species by possessing superior traits that help them survive in a changing environment. One is this species right here. It's the first known bony fish. Okay, so uh, before this, they were these gelatinous fish that, that didn't have bones to them. And these bony fish were more adapted. They were better fit for the environment. From there, we see that we had this tiktaalik species. It was the first known fish with an, what we consider like an elbow joint, which helped it to leave the water for, for short periods of time Okay, to ex escape uh, predators. So... Uh, this is where we see, you know, we started out as single-celled organisms. We became fish eventually. And then in order to make our way onto land, we had to have these transitional species that left the water, these half-fish, half-land-dwelling tetrapods. Then we had um, this uh, Hylonomus, which was believed to be a transitional species of amphibian that led to early reptiles, all right? No longer dependent on the water at the at, at all, on that aquatic habitat. So before we, you know, even once we had that elbow joint, we were able to kind of leave, we still depended, we became amphibians, we were still dependent on that water. But reptiles, they changed the game. They didn't need to depend on that water anymore. And then eventually we became mammals, okay, uh, purgatorious. That is when we became uh, mammals, first primate. And then we start to get towards the hominids, which are, are like the human type species. And uh, one of them that we always hear about is nicknamed Arty, Art, Artipithecus ramidus. All right, one of the first hominids that started to exhibit bipedal behavior, walking on two feet. So previous to that, we dragged our knuckles and we see that, all right, part of being human is standing upright, okay? The first one to do that is this Artipithecus ramidus, and the ape that started to walk on two feet but still climbed trees, as, as they describe it. Then we had Astropithecus uh, africanus, larger brain, smaller teeth. We're working our way, our way away from the, uh, the, the monkeys, the chimpanzees, and we're becoming humans now. And then you have Homo habilis, which they, they nicknamed Handyman, much larger brain, and used stone tools. So now we're starting to see that humans, they're not, they're not better adapted for the environment by being stronger or being bigger or being good at blending in. They're becoming better because they're becoming smarter. It's all about our brains. Our brains are getting larger and larger and larger. We're starting to use tools. We're using fire. So as we move away from chimpanzees from the apes we see that hey we are now you know we're not fit for our environment because we're really good at at eating these fruits which when we were uh when we were apes we were great we were frugivores okay that, that we call them we ate fruits we were great at eating fruits but once we left we had to figure out how to eat other things and it was our big brains as our brains got bigger and bigger we got better and better at just surviving at being able to use tools and just figure out how to survive in whatever environment we were keep in mind over millions of years even hundreds of thousands of years climate changes and we and you know we're going to get more into how climate changes but over these long periods of time, climate change, climates change, and we have to survive no matter what the climate is like. And what helped us wasn't that we were the smartest the, or the biggest or anything like that. It was, or it was that we were smartest. It wasn't that we, we were the biggest or the strongest or anything like that. It was that we were smart. We were able to adapt. We were able to use our brains and make us survive, make it work. Homo erectus, that's a major transitional species because our brain got even larger. We started to look more and more like humans and less and less like apes. And uh, we're con it's considered a, a, a transitional species, uh, more importantly, not only because of the, the brain was larger, but because they started to leave Africa. So before this, everything's in Africa. We're all we're in Africa this whole time as, as apes. 
and then even as Astropithecus and and, uh, and Homo habilis. But then we become Homo erectus, and we left Africa. You have Homo uh, neanderthalensis, uh, even larger brain, uh, almost double in size compared to Homo habilis. More uh, more human-like facial features, flat face, small brow ridge, which you think of as being a Homo sapien or a human type features. We don't have that ape-like look to it anymore. We're starting to control fire. We're understanding fire. And they actually coexisted with Homo sapiens at one point which is why we see that some people have uh, some genes that uh, Neanderth Neanderthals had. So um, then eventually we became Homo sapiens. Our brains got even larger. Flat forehead, tiny brow ridge, small teeth, grasp uh, symbolic thought. So, you know, you're thinking about, oh, these are just minor changes. The brain's just getting a little bit bigger by 100 or 200 cc's. The... the the face, the forehead is going from semi-flat to flat. These are my minor changes, but it takes that long. It takes hundreds of thousands of years just to see those minor changes. So you can imagine how long it takes to go from a, uh, you know, a reptile to a human. It takes millions and millions of years. So no one's saying that evolution happened uh, overnight or anything like that. But over millions of years, these tiny, tiny changes over many, many generations, eventually we see those large changes changes. So still contain about 99% of the same DNA as chimpanzees and bonon, uh, bonobos. Um, and that's where we see that less than 1% of our DNA is still the same as, as the next human next to us. So natural selection humans being in different regions created different skin colors. That's why we see that there's caucasoids and there's negroids um, and there's mongoloids. We have those eight, we have Asians, we have blacks, we have white people. Um, it's, it's all because we were living in different regions. When you look at a white person versus a black person, there's a difference because we had to uh, start uh, adapt to producing vitamin D3 during the winter time. Okay, when when uh, you know humans left Africa and they started to live in these colder climates, well, suddenly we have a decrease in the amount of vitamin D3 that we're synthesizing because we need the sun to do so, and we were not doing that very well in the winter time. And that's why our skin had to get lighter. Um, bigger brains meant being able to find newer foods and have a better understanding of foods that they could and couldn't eat. Um, we could explore new territories. We could use uh, our, our knowledge from the past, from what we've eaten before, and really put it all together. So it wasn't like we were staying, we were a little chipmunk staying in one area, eating the same thing every day. We were able to use our brains to, to catalog what could we eat, what can't we eat, so that as climate changes and as uh, the seasons change, we know what we can eat each month of the year. All right, yeah, okay, these are around this month of the year. We the year we can eat this, and then you know the buffalo come around this time. We can do that with this, and and then we see that you know the roots are heavy in this area, so we can go and eat these roots, but don't eat these roots and eat these leaves. But you can't eat these leaves, and we can eat these berries. So we start to catalog what we're eating, and we're able to keep track of this because our brains are so big. Um, we had big external noses that jut out from the face that looks very different from an ape because then it creates turbulence uh, to humidify the incoming air for our, our airways. Um, you know, and just to go back to what we were saying, big brains. So brains double in size in 2 million years, which 2 million years, very long time. It's relatively a short amount of time in relation to uh, the traits that we see change throughout the, the history of, of evolution. So evolution takes a very, very long time. And, and the fact that in 2 million years, our brains doubled, that's major. So big brains meant more co cooperation between each other. We were able to live together and cooperate towards a common goal, more self-control, more food, and navigating new landscapes, um, land, new landscapes, and ultimately we crossed the Bering Strait uh, land bridge to make it to the Americas. So this just shows you a phylogenetic tree of the hominids. This is just a small phylogenetic tree of just the hominids. So if we were to look at a phylogenetic tree of all the organisms ever, it would be huge, all right? It would be huge. But this is just showing you how we, you know, we were. Uh, Artipithecus, and then we eventually made our way to Homo sapiens. And the whole time, our uh, our traits are slowly changing. It it shows you how we're going from 
being uh, somewhat bipedal to completely bipedal and how our brains are getting larger and larger and larger. Look, we see, all right, 600 cc brain, suddenly 1200 cc, and then to where we are right now, 1400 cc's, which is actually the peak, okay? We can't, our brains aren't going to get any bigger. It takes up too much energy, and that's where we see that, all right, natural selection is still working because anyone that um, along the way might have had an even bigger brain, they got weeded out. Those genes were not fit to be passed on. They didn't live long enough to pass on those genes because it was too much energy. Keep in mind, you don't want to just be the biggest thing ever because then you need more food. So, you know, that's why the dinosaurs died out. And that's why a lot of organisms have died out over time is not because, uh, you know, it, natural selection isn't just about being the biggest or strongest. It, you have to fit or you have to gel with your uh with your environment so keep these things in mind as we move forward uh, make sure that you're you're looking at uh the genetics and the epigenetics and the evolution so that you do well on the quiz <laughs>